Hey, it's Cairo. Welcome back to the channel. Today, about two hours ago, some new spoilers were revealed for Dominaria United, and I can't wait to check them all out and play with them on September 1st when the set uh, releases for Arena. Today, I'm going to give a preliminary rating to them without knowing anything about the rest of the set. Just looking at them, rating them on face value, and then there's going to be some speculation in here as to maybe things are better than I say or worse than I say, but we'll get a general idea today. If you like the video, please hit that thumbs up. Consider subscribing for more Dominaria United spoilers and gameplay. So, without further ado, let's go. So to kick things off, right off the bat, we have Archangel of Wrath. Two white, two generic for a 3-4 flying lifelink. Already a pretty good rate for four mana to have a 3-4 in the air that if your opponent doesn't have a flyer, you're able to attack in, gain some life. But it also has a kicker here, and it can be kicked multiple times, either for one black or for one red or both. So if you're playing Mardu, you can kick this for a cost of six mana, one black, one red, two white, two generic. Now, when it is kicked once, it deals two damage to any target. If it's kicked both times, it deals two damage to another target. So keep in mind that the Archangel of Wrath is going to be dealing the damage itself, and it has lifelink. So potentially, you're going to be able to take out two small toughness creatures and gain two life twice with two different triggers. So if you're under the gun, you're playing a mid-range deck, something like that, you're low on life, this is going to gain you four life, you can deal it right to their face too. So it potentially can come down for six mana, deal four damage to them, and you gain uh, four life. Or you can deal it to a Planeswalker. I think this card's going to be pretty strong. I think I would rate it probably about a seven, maybe an eight out of ten. The next card we have is a common. It's Banalish Sleeper, one white, one generic for a Phyrexian Human Soldier. A lot of really good flavor here showing the corruption of the Phyrexians. This is a sleeper agent. It comes in as a two drop with three power, one toughness, a kicker of one black. So if you have this in Orzhov colors, you're able to pay this kicker. When Banalish Sleeper enters a battlefield, if it was kicked, each player sacrifices a creature. Right off the bat, this is reminding me of Demon's Disciple, which was pretty playable and limited. I don't think this is going to be seeing any constructed play because it's common, and we demand a lot of things out of our two-drop creatures. Luminarch Aspirant saw a lot of play, one of the best two drops in Zendikar Rising. It's going to be rotating, but these are the kind of things that we want to see optimally in constructed formats out of our two drops. It's not going to see that, but I can see this playing limited play. I'm going to give it probably like a 5 or a 6 for limited. It's not amazing. It's not going to be your pack 1 pick 1, but it's going to be a nice filler and aggressive deck. Okay, first blue card of the day. It is a rare. It's Defiler of Dreams, which is Phyrexian Sphinx. 2 blue, 3 colorless. It is flying at 4, 3. Pretty beefy creature for blue. As an additional cost to cast blue permanent spells, you may pay 2 life. These spells cost one blue less to cast if you paid life this way. This effect reduces only the amount of blue mana that you pay, and whenever you cast a blue permanent spell, you draw a card. Okay, so right off the bat, we know this can pretty much, if they don't have an, a flyer, we can get in there for four every turn. Now, keep in mind that this only goes to reduce blue permanent spells. So when you're countering spells, when you're bouncing things, you're doing you know all the things that blue likes to do, you cannot reduce the casting cost of this way. If it was the case, that would be really, really a great card. But having the flexibility to cast blue permanent spells for one less mana than they're needed, whenever you have counter spells that you're wanting to play, removal, things like that in a blue deck I could see being beneficial. Say you have five mana, you have a four drop, okay? But you also have a counter spell in the hand. You wanna be able to cast something for three, you can do that now, you can pay the life. As long as you're not getting hammered by aggro and you're behind, you can pay two life to get that in, save the two mana to play your thing, or maybe your card draw spell or whatever on the opponent's turn. So the flexibility here I think is very good. It is not legendary, so it's possible to have two of these on the board, reducing the cost you do have to pay for life to do that. I don't know if you're going to want to do that or you're going to have the life resources to do that, but I think this is a pretty decent card. I think this is probably going to be a six or seven. Next up, we have Guardian of New Benalia. It's one white, one generic for a human soldier. Two, two, it has a new ability called Enlist. And Enlist means when this creature attacks, you can tap another non-attacking creature you control without summoning sickness. And when you do, add its power to this creature's power until end of turn. And whenever Guardian of New Benalia enlists a creature, you get to scry too, which is nice. And also, we're getting seasoned Hollow Blade vibes from this card because we can discard a card 
Guardian of New Banalia gets indestructible until end of turn and tap it. And that is a very powerful effect whenever you're wanting to be aggressive. You can go in with this, you play this on turn two, turn three, if you have a one one that you played on turn one, you can enlist it, go in for maybe as a three two, four two, something like that, optimally on turn two or turn three. You can discard a card. Now, if you're discarding a card, the payoffs here are gonna be things that you can flash back, such as Homestead Courage, things like that, where they're in your graveyard, but you still can get the resources out of them. Also, the scry two effect is actually quite a bit more potent than if you were to scry one, and having this in white instead of just blue is kind of cool. Let's you line up your draws. Now, it's not gonna let you draw cards, because it is white, and white is the worst at that, but it will help you line up your draws and plan for the future. I think Guardian of New Banalia is gonna see play um, the enlist thing is really exciting and new, and I think it's going to breathe some fresh air into the mechanics of the new rotation. And I'm going to say it's probably like a seven, six or seven. Okay, our first is it card of the day. One red, one blue for Joyra Ageless Innovator. Two, three power and toughness for two, not bad. She has one ability. Tap, put two ingenuity counters on Joyra Ageless Innovator. Then you may put an artifact card with mana value X or less from your hand onto the battlefield where X is the number of ingenuity counters on Joyra. Now this might not seem like much. It's really going to depend on the strength and the um, availability of artifact cards in the new standard meta. But what I will say is you can play this on turn two. Turn three, you're tapping. You can immediately put a two cost artifact from your hand onto the battlefield. So if there are powerful artifacts, I'm thinking something like the vehicle from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty that costs two, it comes in, you can tap it to draw a card or you can crew it up or something like that. If we see more of these on as two or three and four drops, we might see some uh, some play with Jorah. This is obviously a build around card. We're going to have to see the power of artifacts come out and this is not really great by itself. It relies that you have artifacts in your hand, but the potential is high. The ceiling is high there. I'm going to say it's probably a five. Next up, we have our first reprint that I know of in the set is Liliana of the Veil. Two black, one generic for Planeswalker, Liliana. Awesome new art on this. So Liliana of the Veil has historically been a powerful card because of the versatility of all of the abilities. She comes in with three loyalty counters. You can plus one, each player discards a card. Yes, you have to discard two, but if you have cards with flashback or the new... Uh, mechanic that we saw in Streets of New Capenna, the Blitz ability, such as with Tenacious Underdog, something like that. Some way that you can utilize your graveyard you want to build around for Liliana of the Veil. Also, you can immediately minus two and have target players sacrifice a creature. Now, this is not necessarily great against aggro decks because their creatures are, you know, they're wide and they have a lot of them to sacrifice, but against the mid-range or control deck, if Liliana sticks around and is on the board and they don't deal with Liliana, they play, you know, they invest four, five, six mana into a creature. Next turn, you make them sacrifice it. It's a very, it's a huge advantage. And then minus six is very, very potent. But we'll see how Liliana of the Veil vale stacks up in the current standard post rotation. I have a feeling that she's going to be very good as she historically has been. I'm going to say it's probably a seven. Next, we have Nishoba Brawler. One green, one generic for a cat warrior. It has star, power, three toughness. It has trample. And it has domain. So this is a mechanic for Dominaria United that cares about the lands that you have, particularly what type of lands or how many basic land types that you have. Its power is equal to the number of basic land types among lands that you control. So this, the floor for this is obviously pretty low. So if you play this on turn two in a green and you only have um, forest out, this is going to be a 1-3 trample. It's not going to be very good. The ceiling for this is that you have a Triome from Streets of New Capenna, that is not a forest. So all the triomes count as three different lands. But this could potentially come out on turn two as a 4-3 trample. That's going to be a little bit hard to pull off considering that you want to have a forest out, out of your two lands and you want to have a triome that's not a forest type. So you'd have to have like the Esper triome or something that's a plains, island, swamp, and then have a forest for it to be a 4-3. But the ceiling on it is 5-3 trample for two. I don't know how often you're going to want to do that, particularly because this card seems to be poised towards aggro. All it is is a big trampling brawler, and the Triomes aren't great speaking right now for aggro because they're just a little bit too slow. They come in tapped, so I think this card's probably like a four. I don't think it's going to see any constructed play. Could be good and limited. We'll see as more cards come out. 
Sagas are back in Dominaria United, and this is the first one that they are spoiling right now and the one that we're revealing today. This is a blue one. Too blue, too generic. And the new thing with Sagas is they have Read Ahead now. So as you played Sagas before, you would have to go through every single step. Now with Read Ahead, you can choose what step you want them to enter on, and you just skip whatever steps that you don't want. But you never get to go back and get them. So you could technically play Phasing of Zolf here just on step three if you want to. But let's look at the entire card. So step one and two, another target non-land permanent phases out. It cannot phase in for as long as you control the phasing of Zulfir. So there's a couple ways to use this. If you have a great board presence, you can phase out your two best things. And then on turn three, as we can see right here, it's going to destroy all creatures. So you can protect your things from being destroyed. Or if you're... Being aggressive and you want to try to win the game, you can cast this for four, phase something out of theirs, phase another thing out, and then just kind of go through getting rid of their blockers. So uh, step three is destroy all creatures. For each creature destroyed this way, its controller creates a 2-2 black Phyrexian creature token. This is very situational. So if your opponents have a bunch of little 1-1s, 2-2s, wiping the board, giving them back all 2-2s is not going to be great. However, if they have a couple of really big creatures that are bomby, destroy all of them, give them back to uh, Black Phyrexian creature tokens, especially if they're counting on those creatures to finish the game. So this is going to be, I think, a, a situational card. It is a very versatile card. You also get the 2-2 the two -two Black Phyrexian creature tokens if you have creatures. But I'd be interested to know what you think about this card. I'm going to say this card is probably right around the middle of the road because it's it's obviously a build around a situational card to me. Next, we have Legendary Creature in Azorius Colors. We have Wrath, Weather, Light, Stalwart. One blue, one white for a 1-3. It's a defensive creature that has high toughness relative to its power for two. When you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you may tap two untapped creatures you control. If you do, draw a card. And for white, white, three generic creatures you control, get plus one, plus one, and gain vigilance until end of turn. So this screams tempo to me. We've seen some Azorius tempo. I've played some of them over the last month, and it's actually pretty good. You can get down a couple of cheap creatures, you know, Delver, things like that, protect them. Um, the interesting thing about Wrath to me is you play this on turn two, you hold interaction in your hand in the form of counter spells and fading hope and bounce spells and things like that. And then you just kind of wait. You play this, you have another creature out. They attempt to use removal, you fade uh, fade out the back, you do things in response to them, and then you tap those creatures on their turn, you draw a card. So if you can get two or three cards off of Wrath, Weatherlight, Stalwart to keep beating that gasoline into your tempo deck and just putting pressure on the opponent, I think it's quite good. I think it's probably a six. Next, we have a card that players have been asking for for a long time. They've been wanting the Raven Man, and we finally got the Raven Man. So we have one black, one generic for a human wizard legendary creature at 2-1. And at the beginning of each end step, if a player discarded a card this turn, create a 1-1 one, one black bird creature token with flying, and this creature can't block. Also has a mana sync ability here for four mana tap. Each opponent discards a card, activate only as a sorcery. So this is going to be a build around dependent on making your opponent discard things. I think the four cost trigger to make them discard a card and make a bird token that can't block is pretty powerful um for two mana have a two one this thing is not going to be able to brawl at all it's going to be dependent on synergizing with this card but having the birds go in the air those birds could add up you pair this with liliana of the veil where you make them discard a card on turn three all of a sudden you have a bird i mean this could see potential i think it's probably like a five or a six it might be higher let me know what you think in the comments I'm having a hard time thinking about any time that a pure deck that rewards discard has been good over the past year or so. That could change with cards that come out in Dominaria United. So here's the card that everybody has been waiting for. There was a spoiler of Shieldren that came out about two or three weeks ago, maybe two weeks, and I covered it on the channel. It was a spoiler that had a different text in this, so it obviously turned out not to be real. But there is a Shieldred card, and it's Shieldred the Apocalypse. Two black, two generic, four Phyrexian Praetor, legendary creature. Four, five, death touch. Whenever you draw a card, you gain two life. When an opponent draws a card, they lose two life. Card is very good. It's simple. It's very good, though. It has a high power and toughness. It can sit there and block things every turn that they draw a card. 
just at the baseline, they're losing two life and you're gaining two life every time it comes back to you. It has death touch. So if they come in with a big uh, six, six, seven, seven or whatever, you're under pressure, you can at least block with this, kill their thing and trade off. And you've already probably gotten, you know, six life out of the deal or whatever. Shieldred's good. I think Shieldred's like an eight. It's going to see play, maybe nine. This is a very interesting card. This is in Grixis colors. It's Solkinar the Tainted. So it's a total cost of five, one of each color, and two generic. At the beginning of your end step, choose one that has not been chosen. Draw a card. Each opponent loses two life, and you gain two life. Solkinar the Tainted deals three damage to up to one other target creature or planeswalker, or exile Solkinar, then return it to the battlefield under an opponent's control. So you bring this down on turn five, four with ramp. You choose one of the three things, and then three turns later, they get Solkinar, and the whole process starts over again. This reminds me a lot of Demonic Pact. This has a potential to see a lot of play. I think this is a very good card. It's a 5-5 five, five body. You can brawl. You get to draw a card. Then you can situationally kill one of their things with three toughness or just kill one of their planeswalkers. And then you get to drain two life and gain two life from them. And then whenever they go to get this, if you are in black, build some sacrifices uh, payoffs in your deck. So things like Deadly Dispute, which is rotating, but things like that that reward you for sacrificing creatures. And then just sacrifice Solkinar. So you have to time it right, but you can potentially pay 5 for a 5-5, five, five, draw a card, drain some life, kill a creature, and then just sacrifice this, put it in your own graveyard, and then just be done with Solkinar. Pretty good. I think it's an 8. Next, we have a homage, a throwback to an original creature from way back in the day. This is Squee Dubious Monarch. One red, two generic for a legendary creature, Goblin Noble. It's a 2-2 two, two haste for three. And when it attacks, you create a 1-1 one, one red goblin creature token that's tapped and attacking. And then you may cast Squee Dubious Monarch from your graveyard by paying four, one red, three generic, and exiling four other cards from your graveyard rather than paying its mana cost. So it's a three drop, two, two haste. You get in there, you make another goblin token. If you have a goblin lord, some way to reward going wide, something like Burn Bright or you know, uh, something that gives a lot of power based on how many goblins you have or whatever. This could be good. So it has to be the right deck. I mean, it's going to be mono red aggro, maybe Boros aggro, but basically just goblin tribal is going to like this. We're going to see how many goblins we have and if goblins are good. Some of the goblins that have been good over the past um, few months are rotating out. We had the goblin battle leader two drop from adventures in the forgotten realms and that's a very good card a very good goblin enabler but that's going away so we'll see how good this card is based on what goblin synergies we have right now i'm going to give it five and the last card we have for today is zur eternal schemer this is esper three drop one black one blue one white and it is a one four flying so it is a highly defensive creature and it says enchantment creatures you control have death touch, life link, and hex proof. Now there are enchantment creatures that have been introduced in Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. Not a lot of them are in these colors. They're mostly in green and white, some in red. But there are, I think, a few. Um, it also has the ability of one white, one generic target, non-aura enchantment you control. Becomes a creature in addition to its other types and has base power and base toughness, each equal to its mana value. So we're talking about... For two mana, making something permanently a creature, which makes it subject to removal. But you can do this with sagas. You can do this with the main thing that comes to mind for me is Esper Control with a Wedding Announcement. The three mana um, enchantment in white that makes tokens. And then after the third token that it makes, well, it draws you cards or makes token and then becomes plus one, plus one anthem effect for everything. So then you could animate that, make that into a three or four, four brawler. Um, things like Hollowed Haunting, a four drop. Whenever you play an enchantment, you make a spirit token, and then it can get huge. I think this card's very, very good. Obviously a build around, but I'm going to say this is probably a nine. It's got four toughness. It's a flyer. You play this on turn three. It's going to be able to block basically whatever aggro throws at it. And if they don't deal with it, all of a sudden you just start animating all of your auras and all your sagas and things. I think it's very good.
That's going to do it for today. There are more cards that were spoiled, but I don't have a lot of time. I'm going to, probably going to do a part two of these videos with the other cards once I get to analyze them, but I wanted to get this video out today. Keep in mind, this is just my initial take on these cards. If you disagree, I'm totally welcome to hearing your opinions, and maybe there's something that I missed. There probably is something that I missed. So shoot me a comment below. I would love to hear about additional synergies or your ideas with these things. And as always, I try to get these out as timely as possible. I try to be as efficient and um, use my knowledge whatever to whatever effect it is to give some insight or at least start the conversation. So if you like this video, please hit that thumbs up. Consider subscribing for more Dominaria United spoilers as they come out and gameplay, which I'm super excited for. So until next time. Have a great day.